In the previous video, you saw how the Counter-Reformation hides John's timeline given in Revelation chapter 11 verse 2, and that this timeline would have placed the coming of the two witnesses no later than 134 AD. And the conclusion of the entire period in Counter-Reformation theology, which they refer to as the seven-year tribulation period, is completely finished by no later than 138 AD. And based on their own dating methods, the two witnesses would have come and gone several centuries ago, not at the end of time or the end of the world, as they claim. And you saw, that the historic method of interpretation, produces the date of 1390 AD. Which is the date of 130 AD, when Jerusalem was given to the Gentiles as the city of Aelia Capitolina, plus 1260 years later. Bringing John's time frame for events at the end of chapter 10 and the coming of the book, and the beginning of chapter 11 and the coming of the two witnesses, to the year 1390 AD. And those are your only two realistic honest options for Revelation 11 verse 2, if you are going to remain consistent with the text. Because there is no gap in John's timeline. You also saw that the phrase, the little book, in verses 2, 8, 9 and 10, actually referred to the Greek term, Bibliuridian. And that was a new term introduced by John at the close of the New Testament era, to refer to the earliest forms of what we know today as a book. Not a miniature book, but an actual book. And it was little in comparison to the larger scrolls, which had previously been the normal medium for collecting and preserving writings. The common Bible of today, would have been referred to by John, as a Bibliuridian. That is an important clarification because half of John's prophecy in Revelation 10 is about the coming of a Bibliuridian, or what we would call, a book, today. You saw that the English phrase, that there should be time no more, in verse 6, was caused by the fact that the word chronos was translated as the word time, rather than carried over directly into English, and this created a misstatement of John's text, because he was writing a prophecy against chronos, not against time itself. And as you saw previously, Kronos was known as Saturn, in Latin. And was the real reason for the season, the Saturnalia, which is the historical precursor to our modern day Christmas. You saw that the seven thunders in verses 3 and 4, along with the reference to cloudiness and a rainbow in verse 1, were all part of a prophecy about a coming storm flood of biblical proportions, and that the command not to write down what the seven thunders said, was a time conversion instruction to correctly calculate the date of the storm, which gave us the date of 1362 AD. And that the seven sounds that John heard, was a prophecy about seven voices, which would be heard during this time in history, prior to the coming of the Bibliuridian, or book, in 1390 AD. And you saw that John's description of the rainbow angel in verse 1, was a description of Orion descending to the western horizon at sunset, with Saturn positioned over Orion's head, as a sign in the heavens, in 1355 AD, indicating the coming of a great storm, seven years later. And you saw that John's astronomically dated time frame from this material in chapter 10 begins in 1355 AD with the appearance of Saturn over Orion on the western horizon. A great flood in 1362 AD, seven years later. And the coming of the book, in 1390 AD. Synchronized with the appearance of seven voices or people, whose messages would impact history, prior to the coming of the book in 1390 AD. In this video, we are going to go through the text in chapter 10 verse by verse, and look at this period of time in actual history. We will compare what we find in history with John's prophecies and his astronomically dated timeline, to see what actually happened, and if these prophecies were fulfilled, and if so, how they occurred. We will begin with John's description, of the coming of the rainbow angel, beginning in verse 1. Now that we have clarified what John was actually prophesying in Revelation chapter 10, you see that John was not prophesying about the end of the world, or the end of time, as the Counter-Reformation claims. But instead, he was prophesying a set of events which would culminate in the year 1390 AD, with the publication of a book, which would impact the course of human history. Specifically, the rule of the Antichrist, in the western half of the Roman Empire. The series of prophetic events John lays out for his readers begins with an astronomical dating of an historical timeline, which he describes as beginning with the positioning of Saturn over Orion, on the western horizon, which occurs on January 15, 1355 AD, 
Revelation chapter 10 verse 1 reads as follows, quote, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. End quote. As you saw in the previous video, John's reference to the mighty angel, which was called Cassiel in Hebrew, is Orion. John describes him as descending from heaven, which is a reference to the western horizon, and his face as the sun, referring to the time around sunset. But there are three other detailed observations about this text, that we need to note about his prophecy. The first reference invokes the rainbow from Noah's flood, indicating a flood. And the second invokes feet as pillars of fire, from the exodus, which indicate an exodus, from something. A coming out, of something which is what the word exodus means, and which is very similar in meaning to the Greek term ekklesia, which also means to be, called out. The third detail observation, comes from his reference to Orion. Orion is pictured in the sky, fighting against Taurus, earlier identified by John as the ox. In Western constellation systems, Taurus was depicted as a bull, but in Eastern tradition, and in John's descriptions, Taurus is depicted as an ox. An ox is actually the same animal as a bull. There is no difference between an ox and a bull, except for the fact, that an ox is castrated. To render them less aggressive, for domestic uses, such as plowing or pulling carts. And Orion is fighting the ox. As you will see in a moment, that detail was an incredibly important and specific part of John's prophecy, about what is to come. Remember that Orion is fighting against the ox. When we get to verse 2, you are going to see further evidence, that John is describing a constellation in the sky, not a Greek Nike, that the Counter-Reformation chooses to interpret every occurrence of the word, angel, within their conceptual translations of these texts in Revelation. And in this switch, you will see one of the more amazingly hypocritical assertions you will hear from them. They will, on the one hand, actually attempt to equate astronomical dating, to astrology. And then on the other, translate all references to angels in the heavens, as Greek Nikes. What were Greek Nikes? They were the attendant demonic spirits, of the mother goddess Athena. Which is quite an amazing example of choking on a gnat, and then swallowing a camel. Astronomical dating, is not the same as astrology. Astronomical dating is simply the marking of a time frame by astronomical positions. It is the same thing that is done with the creation of every calendar in existence including the Hebrew one, recorded in the Bible. And it used to be how all time was marked, for all people in the world, including Hebrews, before the invention of clocks. The entire Old Testament calendar year was marked and counted, by astronomical dating. Everything from feast days to Sabbaths were counted by observing the occurrence of astronomical dating. It was not astrology. The claim they are equivalents is patently stupid. And then to substitute, what John himself actually states in chapter 1 verse 20, saying verbatim, that his use of the term angelos in Greek, is a direct reference to the seven stars, with Greek Nike demonic spirits, is laughably hypocritical, beyond belief. But yet, that is precisely what some actually do. When we come to verse 2, we see in John's use of grammar, another fact, which demonstrates John's reference was not to a Greek Nike, descending out of the sky. Chapter 10 verse 2 in the transliteration reads as follows. Quote, and holding in the hand of him a Bibliaridian opened up, and placed was the foot of him, the right upon the sea, but the left upon the land. End quote. Now here is what is amazing about verse 2. In chapter 10 verse 1, John describes seeing the messenger descending out of heaven, which we noted was Orion on the western horizon descending out of the sky toward the horizon. When John describes seeing this descent, he uses the present tense. Or in other words, the angel is descending as he is seeing it, in progress. It is happening while he is seeing it. Descent is occurring, while he is looking at it. But when you get to verse 2, which comes after verse 1, he says he sees one foot was placed on land and another was placed on water. John changes tenses. And he changes the tense, to the eras tense, which is the Greek past tense. Meaning the angel had already planted in position, one over land and the other over water, in the past tense, before, he sees him descending, in the present tense. So in other words, the feet are already planted, one over land and the other over sea, as he is.
descending from the sky. Which also means grammatically, it is impossible that John is referring to a Greek Nike floating down from the sky and then planting his feet over land and sea. Because the planting of the feet would have to come after the descending. But John has reversed the tenses, stating the feet were positioned before the descent. And that could only be a reference to an already positioned constellation, precisely as it clearly reads in the text. The constellation Orion is shown with a lot of variations in illustration art. Sometimes he is shown holding a shield, and sometimes he is shown holding an animal. But John describes the thing that he is holding, he sees as a Bibliaridian, or book. And it is open. If you look at Orion in the sky, he is precisely as John describes. If you place an open Bible in Orion's hand, you can see the shape of the constellation traces an open book. He looks almost like a preacher, with his hand raised in the air. And you can see from the outline of the constellation itself. What he is holding in his hand is not a miniature, or tiny, book. It is a book, plain and simple. Not little. You can see the outline of what John was describing right there in the sky, in the constellation Orion. And it is a book. Not a tiny or miniature, booklet. As you have seen in earlier videos, John is redefining the constellation values in the sky, with his own definitions, as he is using them to date his prophetic events. And here with Orion, we see that being done again. Instead of a shield or a dead animal in his hand, John describes Orion holding an open Bibliaridian, or Bible, in his hand. And in a moment, we will look a little deeper at how John's word Bibliaridian is actually historically connected to our modern word Bible. In chapter 10 verse 3, John makes the transition to the seven thunders stating, quote, And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. End quote. And this is the text that begins his transition into the seven thunders, indicating both the coming storm and seven voices in history. Seven in Hebrew culture was the number for completion or fullness. The symbolism of seven voices would indicate an historical movement of some kind around the place and time of this storm, which, as you recall was dated in our astronomical timeline of 1362 AD and located in the far western half of the Roman Empire. In verse 4, we read in the KJV, the following, quote, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. As we saw in the previous video, this text was a time conversion text, with the instruction not to write it out. Which gave us the value of 28 years before 1390 AD, taken from chapter 11 verse 2. In verse 5, we read, quote, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. End quote. You see how in the English translation it sounds like John is seeing him lift up his hand to heaven, but once again the Greek word for lift, which is, aero, is in the Aras tense again. Meaning it is actually in the past tense. The angel had already lifted up his hand to heaven, before descending. So he is coming down out of heaven, with one foot on land, another foot on water, and his hand lifted up to heaven. Already. Before his descending. And once again, that grammar makes it clear he is referring to the fixed positions of a constellation, which then descends, not a Greek Nike, which descends and then puts his feet in these positions, and raises his hand. Now we come to verse 6, and John's reference to Kronos in the Greek, which we will read from the transliteration. Quote, and swore on the one living into the eons of eons that created the heaven and all in it and the land and all in it and the sea and all in it that, Kronos, should not be any more. End quote. Of course, you saw the translation problem that is created, in the previous video, when Kronos is buried under the translation of that word into the English word, time. Even though it is an accurate translation. John was writing a prophecy against Kronos, not against time. And as you saw earlier, Kronos was called Saturn in Latin. The same Saturn that was worshipped in the Saturnalia. And even though the Romans associated Kronos or Saturn with the planet we call Saturn today, Jews did not equate these identities. In Hebrew, the planet Saturn was called Shabbatai, and distinguished from the pagan Greco-Roman deity Saturn, worshipped through idolatry. Whom they considered a false Greco-Roman god, 
not the actual planet, itself. And thus why John mentions Saturn, over Orion, in his very prophecy against Kronos, stating Kronos, the god of Rome's golden age, should be no more. And this is the lead into, both the coming of the book, at the end of chapter 10, and the coming of the two witnesses in Jerusalem, in chapter 11. Both of which, are actually about bringing Kronos, to an end. Which he states right here in verse 6. When we come to verse 7, we have another very interesting cloaking, that takes place by counter-reformation preachers. The English KJV reads as follows. Quote, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery John is talking about is written about in the Bibliaridion which is open in the angel's hand, to be read. And he defines that mystery very clearly in the Greek text. He says it is the one that was declared to God's servants, the prophets, which they wrote about, and is now in the Bibliaridion, which is open in the angel's hand. But in the Greek text, you are going to see that much more explicitly expressed in his language. Here is the Greek inner linear text. Quote, But in the days of the voice of the seventh trumpet messenger as begins to trumpet, then ends the mystery of God as you angle and zeal, of his servants the prophets. End quote. As you see in the inner linear, the word that is translated into English as, the word, declared, is actually the Greek word, you angle and zeal, which is the Greek word, that we get our English word, evangelism, from. Everyone knows what the euangelion is, and everyone also knows it is no, mystery. At least not anymore, but at one time in history, it actually was. And this grammatical and linguistic fact, undeniably points, to a very real period of history, not the end of the world. And the period of time John is prophesying about, which is very very clear in this text, is when the Evangelion, or Evangel, went from being an actual mystery to the people, to no longer being a mystery to the common person. The mystery of it, was brought to an end. And that did occur in history past, at a very specific point in history. And it is no accident, that the very time in history John is prophesying about, on his astronomically dated timeline, just so happens to be the very same time in history, this all began to occur. Which you will see more about in a few minutes. But you can see from the Greek, how much is being hidden by counter-reformation preachers in Revelation chapter 10. They don't want you to see the time frame in chapter 11 verse 2. They don't want you to see the angel is a reference to Orion. They don't want you to see there is a reference to Kronos. They don't want you to see there is a reference to the Bible. And they don't want you to see there is a reference to evangelism and the gospel. They really don't want you to see anything in this chapter, but the end of the world, and their make-believe, cover stories for this text. But it's all quite apparent and obvious, in the underlying Greek text. And it also exposes their false explanations for what they are, just plain lies. <laughs> Why on earth would an alleged TV evangelist intentionally hide, a prophecy about evangelism, right there in the Greek text in Revelation? Because that's not what they are. And do in fact hide these references. Just as you saw in verse 6 concerning the reference to Kronos. Just as you saw in reference to the Greek tenses in verse 2. Just as you see here now, in verse 7 concerning the Evangelion. They hide these references because if they don't you will see chapter 10 is not about the end of the world, but it is rather, about, real history instead. In verse 8, 9 and 10, we read in the KJV with our correction from the Greek text on the word Bibliaridion. Quote, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the Bibliaridion which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the Bibliaridion. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the Bibliaridion out of the angel's hand, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Everyone is familiar with the expression, the bitter truth. It refers to the experience of thinking the truth is one thing, and then discovering it is actually quite another, perhaps even an opposite, that has been hidden from you. When you discover it, you are glad you have uncovered what was hidden from you, but it is also bitter, in the sense, it is perhaps not what you wanted to hear. 
John writes, after the angel declares Cronos should be no more, the angel commands him to eat the Biblia Ridian, or in other words, devour the scriptures. And there is no question he is referring to the future Bible. Because the words he regurgitates in chapter 11 from eating the Biblia Ridian, or open Bible, which he then writes down, are, in fact, what you read, in the Bible. John created a circular reference, to his own words, and his prophecy, which would one day, be in the very book, he is here prophesying about. Kronos attempted to stay in power, by devouring his children. But here, John contrasts that story with the way to bring Kronos to an end, is to devour the scriptures, and regurgitate them as he states in the final verse of the chapter. Quote, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings. End quote. These are the words John has eaten from the Biblia Ridian, and now he regurgitates them, as more prophecy. And that is how John closes this section of text leading into the coming of the two witnesses in Jerusalem in the very next chapter. Now let's go back through the text, and see how all this was fulfilled in history. Before we begin comparing history to John's prophecies in Revelation chapter 10, it must be noted, that if we just made all this up, if this were all just the invention of imagination and speculation, there would be no way we would find the specific kinds of fulfillments, like we have already seen in the previous chapters. And once again, in chapter 10, if the astronomical dating of John's text were just imagination and invention and speculation, it would be very unlikely, that we would find corroborating occurrences in history, that would just randomly and accidentally match these specifics. Because of the fact, they are piled on top of one another, making the co-occurrence of each event, all synchronized together, that much less likely, or highly improbable. Here is John's astronomically dated timeline for Revelation chapter 10. As mentioned earlier, John marks the beginning of this period of history, with Saturn over the head of Orion, on the western horizon, which occurred on January 15, 1355 AD. The rainbow angel is a prophetic symbolism of coming events in history. As noted earlier Orion is pictured fighting a bull or an ox. He has one foot on land and the other foot on water, which is a strange symbolism, of a hybrid relationship to the world. Land is often generically used to symbolize Israel, either physically or spiritually, and sea is generically used to symbolize the Gentile empires, or in the New Testament, specifically the Roman Empire. So symbolically speaking, this angel has one foot in the kingdom of God, and one foot in the kingdom of Rome. And it is described by John with both the rainbow upon his head and pillars of fire in the feet. The rainbow being the sign of God's covenant with righteous Gentiles, known as Noachides among Jews, and pillars of fire, being an echo of the Exodus, by which God delivered the people of Israel, out of bondage or slavery, to Egypt. All these facts will prove to be amazingly detailed and accurate references, in John's prophecy, concerning history. A history that has been suppressed by Counter-Reformation theology, to intentionally bury the contents of this chapter, from the public. But the occurrence of this sign, in the heavens, on John's timeline, marks the part of John's prophecy, concerning the coming of a storm flood, of biblical proportions in the western half of the Roman Empire, seven years later in 1362 AD. And it is this event in the middle of chapter 10, which identifies all its surrounding material in history, and makes it very clear, what John had been prophesying in this chapter, beyond any mistake. The same storm, which counter-reformation theology, completely hides, in this chapter altogether. And makes no mention of, whatsoever. The greatest natural disaster to ever occur, on the North American continent, in recorded history, was a hurricane that hit the coast of Texas, at the city of Galveston, in 1900. The destruction was absolute and the death toll was estimated to be as high as anywhere from 6 to 12,000 people. Which was a lot of people at the time, when population centers, were much less populous, than they are today. If you google the word flood and the year 1362 AD, you will discover an amazing thing occurred, in the same exact year, pointed to, by John's astronomically dated prophecy. You will get 365,000 hits on a Google search with those two words.
and the very first entry on the Google search page will display something called the Grode Mandarin, under the title of St. Marcellus Flood. <laughs> the title, the Grode Mandarin, comes from Dutch and means, the great, drowning of men, because over 25,000 people were killed by the storm. It was also called the Great Wind, because wind speeds of the storm were described as being the equivalent of a modern Category 5 hurricane. These are three different references to the same storm. The storm occurred in the very year John prophesied, and it occurred in the very location John prophesied, the western half of the Roman Empire, or Western Europe. It was one of the greatest natural disasters in the history of Western civilization, and although it occurred over half a millennia before the hurricane that decimated Galveston, Texas, the death toll from this disaster was estimated to be more than two to four times greater. It killed over 25,000 people. But what is really amazing about this storm, that created one of the largest floods, in all of European history, is that it began on January 15th, exactly seven years from the sign of Saturn over the head of Orion in 1355 AD. Literally seven years, to the exact day. And there is no way, that could be a random coincidence. But that's not all. If you doubt the significance of the fact, that the storm began exactly seven years later, to the exact day, of the sign of Saturn over the head of Orion in 1355 AD. Then you should also know, that it began precisely, around sunset, exactly as John's prophecy described. To the very hour, of the very day, of the very month, of the very year. Prophesied by John, 1000 years earlier. Not only did this storm come exactly seven years later to the very day of John's prophecy, in the very same year, that John prophesied, in the very same location that John prophesied, to the very hour that John prophesied, it lasted seven days, precisely as John prophesied and thus, the seven thunders. And not only did it occur exactly seven years later, to the day, at sunset, to the hour, for seven days, to the day, in Western Europe, exactly where John prophesied it, it was described as the judgment of God, by those who witnessed its fury. So there was an innate consciousness, in the people who saw this disaster, that there was something very different about this storm. It wasn't just a bad storm, it was a storm of biblical proportions. An apocalyptic storm, that threatened civilization itself. A monk at Canterbury Cathedral, at Oxford University in England, wrote the following chronicle of the event. In his chronicle, he mentions the storm began at around the time of Vespers. Vespers refers to the afternoon hours to early evening, around sunset. January 15, 1362, exactly seven years later to the hour of the sign in heaven of Saturn over Orion, the monk writes. Quote, It was around the hour of Vespers on that day, dreadful storms and whirlwinds such as have never been seen or heard before occurred in England causing houses and buildings for the most part to come crashing to the ground, while others, having had their roots blown off by the force of the winds, were left in a ruined state, and fruit trees in their gardens and other places, along with other trees standing in the woods and elsewhere, were wrenched from the earth by their roots, with a great crash, as if the day of judgment were at hand. And fear and trembling gripped the people of England to such an extent, that no one knew where he could safely hide, for church towers, windmills, and many dwelling houses collapsed to the ground. End quote. The British natural historian, Thomas Short, described the storm, quote, In the evening of January 15, 1362 in England, there began a very strong wind from the southwest. It blew with such force so as to overthrow many strong and mighty buildings, towers, steeples, houses, and chimneys. This continued for six or seven days. Many edifices standing, after the storm was over, had been so shaken, that they required restoration to prevent them from collapsing. End quote. The storm not only continued for seven days, it reshaped entire coastlines, impacting four entire countries in Western Europe, England, Germany, Holland, and Denmark. And the Great Dug System, of Holland, and what is now the modern country of the Netherlands, began being constructed in part, as a result of this disaster. There are physical coastlines which are different today, and dug systems in the Netherlands today, because this prophecy against the Antichrist, who had already come in history, came to pass precisely as John prophesied in Revelation chapter 10. So as you now see, the Great Flood, 
actually did come in history, precisely as John had prophesied it, down to such minute details as its location in Western Europe, its duration for seven days, its actual year and date, and even hour. And if this were all just invention, imagination and speculation, there would be no way, such details could have such precise correlation, to what John had written down and time framed, with the precision of astronomical dating, over a thousand years before. But, John states that the seven thunders, give rise to seven voices. So who were those voices, that like Noah passed through the great flood, and were saved, symbolized in the rainbow, and like Israel in the Exodus, protected by a pillar of fire, passed through the Red Sea to their salvation? Who are these seven voices, and what did they have to do with the coming of the book? You just saw how John provided astronomical dating in Revelation 10 to mark the occurrence of his prophecy on the timeline of history. And you saw how John's prophecy concerning the coming of a flood in 1362 AD, was actually fulfilled, in a most spectacularly literal and accurate way. But what did this storm have to do with the rise of the seven voices, and the coming of the Bibliaridium that John was prophesying about? That is what you are about to see next. And once again, you will see amazing detail, that actually came to pass as real history, in John's prophecies. If you notice in chapter 10 verse 3, it says that the angel cries out with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And then John hears the rumble of seven thunders. This is a contrast text. The angel cries out loudly, as when a lion roars, but the seven thunders rumble is from a distance. With no lightning. It is important to note that lions are used as symbols of kings and monarchies, in the scriptures. Christ is called the Lion of Judah, which is a reference to the royal monarchy of Judah. So we have a contrast of a loud royal voice and rumbling voices off in the distance. This picture will be important to remember as we look at what happened in history. If you look on a map of Europe, at the region where the Grote Mandranka had an impact, in 1362, you will see it virtually covers the same countries that became the center for the Protestant Reformation over a century later. And that is no accident, historically. Because it was out of this very region, and out of this very flood, that the voices came, which John describes as the seven voices. Out of this very same region on the map. And obviously, this is not simply a coincidence. John's prophetic references are not focused on anyone in particular, or personally, otherwise he could have given clues as to their actual names which he chose not to do. He keeps his reference to the symbolical, by summarizing it as seven voices from the seven thunders. But just as the seven thunders had a literal meaning, so does his reference to the voices, which as noted earlier was a clear reference to a movement of some kind in history, which would lead to the coming of the book. A movement of voices. So what was this movement of voices, that came out of the flood, that John was prophesying? And how would you recognize them? And here, once again, we see some absolutely amazing detail, in John's prophecy. The sign of the rainbow angel, which was Saturn over Orion, or Kisil, as it was known in Hebrew, on the western horizon, occurred in the year 1355 AD. But that is not the only thing that occurred in 1355 AD. In the very same year that this sign in the heavens occurred, at the very same time in history, a young theologian, was being appointed a scholar fellowship at the University of Oxford. Oxford comes from Old English, and means, from where the oxen tread. And this is the first documented reference to this person in history. And it occurred in the very same year, that the sign of the rainbow angel, appears in the heavens. But what did this person, have to do with the movement of voices, and the coming of the book, that John prophesied in chapter 10? Well, this person went on to become one of the most key figures, in Western civilization. As his career developed, this person was eventually appointed, as the professorial head, of Canterbury College, at Oxford University. But soon a great cloud of controversy, arose around him, and a storm of conflict, developed, as great as the Grote Mandarin, itself. He was ordered by the Vatican in Rome, to give up his post. There were rumors, this professor, held to heretical views. In 1372, this professor completed his doctorate, and soon afterwards, began publishing works on theology, 
he wrote against the selling of indulgences, and the practice of paying for positions of power, theological training, or religious services, in the Catholic Church, a practice known as, Simon Rhee. He wrote against beliefs such as transubstantiation in the Catholic Mass. And he wrote against, the practice of requiring European states, to give monetary tax payments, to the papacy in Rome. By the year 1377 AD, this Oxford professor had gained a substantial following in England, and the attention of the papacy in Rome. Rome issued an official condemnation of his views as heresy. Nineteen censures were issued against him, by Pope Gregory XI. And he was issued a summons, to appear before the Bishop of London, to answer to the hierarchy of the Church, for his heresies. On May 22, Pope Gregory XI, issued five copies of a papal bull, against this professor at Oxford. For those who do not know what a papal bull is, it is a decree from a pope that carries the full weight of the infallible papacy behind it, and is sealed with the Vatican's leaden seal, called a bulla, which in Latin, means, the boss. And thus it was called a papal bull. B-U-L-L, literally, as in the word bull. Sending them to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Bishop of London, King Edward III, the Chancellor and Oxford, University. In the papal bull, to Oxford, the Pope cited 18 points written by this professor, which were denounced, as erroneous, heretical and dangerous to the union of church and state, and thus the Roman Empire. The name of this professor, who was at war with Oxford, and Pope Gregory's papal bull, was someone by the name of John, Wycliffe. And the movement that he sparked in the very same part of Europe, that the Groot Mandarin occurred, were called, Lollards. His supporters were called Lollards. The Lollard movement, were referenced by a word, that directly referred to, the voice. It was a strange accident of linguistics, that brought them this name. Just as Papal Bull, from Bulla, and Oxford University, from where the oxen tread, were referenced in John's prophecy, so too, were the very name, of the Lollards. The Vatican, seeking to alienate and degenerate them, insulted them with the term, Lollium, which was a Latin word for, tear as in the reference to the story of the wheat and the tares. But the only problem is, that the Latin word for tare, was similar to another word in German and Dutch, that meant something entirely different. It meant a voice quietly, to mumble, or to sing. And so the name, Lollard, which directly referred to their very voices, became, what they were called. Thus fulfilling Revelation 10. It was a movement of voices, just as had been written, Amazing detail that was seen in Revelation chapter 9, down to even the description of the horses' manes, on the Mongolian horses, which invaded from across the Euphrates River, is also seen, once again, in no less degree, in chapter 10, as well. Because not only does John describe the reference to the Lollard name, meaning to mumble, as in the distant thunder which rumbles, he points to two specific facts, in his text, about them, which are as detailed as chapter 9. He states that the Rainbow Angel, which we now know is a reference to the coming of John Wycliffe, roars as a lion. Historically, Wycliffe was able to survive the hostility of Rome, only because he enjoyed protection from John of God, who was the son of King Edward V. And thus he is described by John as roaring like a lion. The lion is actually seen on many of the official logos and coat of arms, of the English monarchy, from medieval times all the way up to even today. And when John is describing the voices, that come from the angel that brings the book, he refers to them as seven distant rumbling thunders. Today, if you do research on the Lollard movement, you are going to discover an amazing historical fact, about this movement associated with John Wycliffe. Not only, does the name, Lollard itself, actually refer to a voice, but, there are actually literally seven voices, which gave rise to it, in England. Literally seven voices, of Lollard Re, which brought it into existence. The 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica notes that there were literally seven voices, referred to by a very word, which literally, means, to mumble. And those seven voices, precisely as John prophesied, were, 1. Nicholas Hereford, 2. John Ashton, 3. John Purvey, 4. John Parker, 5. William Smith, 6. Richard Weistrakt, and 7. Henry Crumb. These are listed in our own modern-day encyclopedia, as literally, the seven voices, of the Lollard movement. 
Lollard being literally, a reference to the voice, mumbling. And this is about as specific and accurate to literal factual history, as any prophecy, in any part of the Bible, could ever be. And it was written over 1000 years before these events occurred, and they are astronomically dated by John, so no one could twist them to mean whatever they please. And if there were not enough already to make this text absolutely unmistakable in history, John's reference in verse 7 to this messenger bringing an end to the mystery of the Euangel and Zoe, that very term in Greek from which we get the term Euangelion, evangelism, puts this prophecy beyond any honest reasonable debate. Because the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica also notes, right after listing the seven voices of the Lollard movement, that quote, Wycliffe had organized in Lutterworth, an association for sending the gospel through all England, a company of poor preachers somewhat after the Wesleyan method of modern times. End quote. And so we see verse 7 of chapter 10, also once again, literally fulfilled in history, with amazing specificity and detail, that cannot be explained away, as simply mere random coincidence. And this is the kind of accuracy and specificity, the Counter-Reformation chooses, to intentionally hide, from the public, and they do hide it. Because they are the very ones being mentioned in these texts, as the enemies of God himself. The Counter-Reformation, soon formed in England, to fight against the influence of John Wycliffe and his Lollards. At first they were known as the Tractarians, but eventually, they would take the very name of the Oxford Movement. And you will see much more about this, in the very next chapter, in Revelation chapter 11, with the two witnesses, where they will be exposed once again, by John, and his prophecies against them. But what did John Wycliffe, and the Lollards, fighting against, Oxford, and the Papal Bull, have to do with the coming of the book? Which John prophesied. They were a grassroots evangelism movement, that demanded the Bible, be made available in the common language, to the public. And thus, John's prophecy about the coming of the book, and why the Rainbow Angel of 1355 AD, was the angel, that was bringing the book. And that angel, was the sign in the heavens, concerning John Wycliffe, and the movement of voices that came out of the storm, which in fact, were the Lollards, and the beginning of the real reformation, in Western Europe. God himself, bore a heavenly prophetic witness to John Wycliffe, and the voices of the Lollards in history, 1000 years before they lived, to break the scriptures free, from the exclusive monopolization, domination and control of Rome. Including John's own, Book of Revelation. And perhaps that is precisely why John wrote this very prophecy, about them, to begin with. And what was the message that John heard the voices speak? In 1396, the Twelve Conclusions of the Lollards, written under King Richard II, were presented to the English House of Parliament. In the second article of the Twelve, the Lollards state that they reject the bishops of Rome, as the livery, or stable, of the Antichrist. Which in fact, it actually was, historically. The Reformation actually began with the Lollards, in England, Germany, Holland, Belgium and France, not with Martin Luther, who did not come along, for another century and a half after them. Long after, the actual Reformation, among the people in Western Europe, had already long since occurred. So, next time you see Orion in the sky, John would have you remember, the coming of John Wycliffe, and the Lollards. And John would have you see, holding in his hand, the book he prophesied would come through this messenger, today, we know, as the Bible. And next we will look at the coming of that book, and how it got its actual name, which once again, is an amazing reference, found in John's prophecy, in Revelation chapter 10, in history. Most people today assume the title, Bible, as in, Holy Bible, is as common today, as it would have been in history past. And the book we have today, has always been around, just like it is today. But at one time, the documents contained in the collection we know today by the term, the Bible, did not exist in the form they do today, nor were they anything the public was allowed to have in their possession, or read. That is not because they did not exist, but because, they had been made illegal contraband, by the Vatican. The Vatican instituted a policy of confiscation of religious and historical literature throughout the empire. Not only involving the Bible, but other religious, historical and theological works as well.
the only surviving copy of Epicurean atheist philosophy, was held in possession exclusively by the Vatican. The original manuscripts of the rabbinical theology of Maimonides, which is central to modern rabbinical Judaism, was also held in exclusive possession by the Vatican. Other works by Josephus, Plato, Suetonius, and Pliny, also met the same fates of confiscations and monopolized possession. So when it came to the New Testament, it was in keeping with the Vatican's policy to hoard information from the public in an attempt to centralize all knowledge on earth, in the exclusive possession of the Vatican. And the New Testament was no exception. This policy of confiscation and control of information was in part, what led to the emergence, of rampant regressive ignorance, and the period of history, known as the Dark Ages in Europe. The terms Old and New Testament, were coined by the authors of the New Testament. They referred to the Law and the Prophets as the Old Testament. The New Testament community, referred to the writings of Christ's Apostles, and the things they were writing about, in those writings, as the New Testament. And they also wrote, that these terms were coined by Christ, during his last Passover Seder, also called the Lord's Supper. The writings of the Apostles and Disciples were collected by New Testament communities across the Mediterranean Basin, and copies of them were made and spread throughout the Empire, as a way to spread their beliefs. There were some occasional disagreements between various communities as to what writings from local sources belonged in this collection, but for the most part, the recognized collection of books, became standardized through usage, throughout their communities. Since these writings were being used to spread their ideas, they also became the source of appeals, in order to argue and win debates and disagreements, within these communities, and even among their rivals. By the time Constantine convened his first ecumenical council, its standard collection was cited as an argument by a bishop named Anathasius, from Alexandria, against a theological position the Vatican was attempting to include in a political compromise to forge political unity. The bishop from Alexandria won his argument, by citing the entire index, of precisely what we know today, as our modern New Testament. His argument was that, the long-standing recognition of the teaching of the Apostles, were universally accepted among all Christians, as having been recorded in these documents, and nothing should be added to them, or taken away from them. His argument worked, because it was already an established and universally accepted premise. But it also created a political problem for the Vatican, that had to be addressed. As a reward to Anathasius for winning his argument, by appealing to the already established and non-controversial index, of New Testament books, recognized by all Christendom, he was exiled, by the Vatican. Not once, but five different times. But the problem of New Testament scripture, interfering with the Vatican's ideological engineering, of its new empire, was eventually solved, by restricting its translation to Latin only, and to be held exclusively in possession only by its authorized Latin priesthood. And this state of confiscation and control of information, remained the official policy, of the empire until the 1300s. When something occurred, that changed the course of human history. This change, was the coming of John Wycliffe. When John Wycliffe emerged in history, there was no Bible. There was something called the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was Jerome's translation of the Bible from the 5th century. But it was not called, the Bible. And no one could read it, unless they were a Catholic priest who had been trained, to read and speak, Latin. To everyone else on earth. It was a dead book, written in a dead language. No one but the priests, had any clue what was in it, and most of what the priests were telling people was in it, was nowhere to be found. A huge deception was being fostered on the world, hidden behind the veil of Latin, and the exclusive possession of the Vatican's Latin priesthood. The official title of this dead book, was the Biblia Sacra Vulgate, or the Sacred Books of the Vulgate. As you saw in the previous video, the Greek term that John uses to prophesy the coming of the book he sees in the hand of the rainbow angel, was the Greek word, Biblia Ridian. Biblia simply meaning books, and Ridian, being the Greek equivalent to the Latin suffix ary as in airy. As used in the Latin word, library. As you saw in the previous video, the root words library and Biblia Ridian were actually equivalent terms. And this is seen in the etymology of the very word Bible, which both Dictionary.com and Etymology Online describe, actually citing the comparison to the term library. So you can see this term did not mean, little book, or tiny book. If you look up the etymology of the English word Bible, 
you will discover it comes from the Old English word Bibliotis. That is a conjunction of two words, Biblio and Udis. The Old English suffix, Udis, is literally the same suffix in Old English, as the Greek suffix, Ridian, as in Bibliaridian, mentioned in Revelation chapter 10. In Greek, the word Bibliaridian, translated into Old English as Bibliotis. This term did not begin to be used, until the time of John Wycliffe. In fact, it was the Wycliffe Bible that brought about this change. Because the Bible prior to this time was entitled, the Biblia Sacra Vulgate. When John Wycliffe decided to cut out the Vatican as the middleman, and make the scriptures available in the vernacular language, the term Vulgate was simply dropped from the title, because that referred to the Latin. And Wycliffe was translating the scriptures out of Latin into the common language. So instead of this book being known as the Biblia Sacra Vulgate, it became known as simply, the Biblia Sacra. Or as we now say in English today, the Holy Bible. Bible, like the Greek word, Bibliaridion, referring to a collection of books, not simply one book, thus its comparison to the term, library. Our modern term Bible, is the direct result of this change in terminology which occurred as a result of Wycliffe's translation in the 1300s. Wycliffe's final product of translation, which was completed after his death, by John Purvey, was issued in 1390 AD. And that is precisely the year that is marked by John's astronomical dating of the coming of the book. What you are now seeing on your screen, is the actual book, that John prophesied, seeing being held in the hand of the angel. It is called the Wycliffe Bible of 1390 AD. And what you are looking at, is the literal fulfillment of John's prophecy, and the actual book, that John prophesied, that he saw in the angel's hand, in Revelation chapter 10, which is by no accident, also contained in this very book, he prophesied. About a century before John Wycliffe lived, in 1234 AD, at the Council of Tarragona, the Vatican spelled out its official policy in regard to anyone caught in possession of the scriptures. It stated in its second canon that quote, No one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in the Romance language, and if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop, within eight days, after promulgation of this decree, so that they may be burned, lest, be he a cleric, or a layman, he be suspected, until he is cleared of all suspicion. End quote. Since around the 600s AD, the Vatican had intentionally destroyed all translations of the scriptures, found in any language, other than Latin. It had passed a number of laws and decrees, actually making the learning of Biblical Hebrew, a criminal act. In political regions in Europe, which gave refuge to dissident groups of Christians, keeping in their possession the scriptures, such as the Waldensians, the Bogo Mills, or the Albigensians, were simply invaded, militarily, and wholesale exterminated, or genocided. It was in the backdrop of these policies of suppression and retribution, that the Wycliffe movement translated the scriptures into the common readable language of the day. The Wikipedia article on the Wycliffe Bible states the following. Quote, Wycliffe's Bible is the name now given to a group of Bible translations into Middle English that were made under the direction of John Wycliffe. They appeared over a period from approximately 1382 to 1395. These Bible translations were the chief inspiration and chief cause of the Lollard movement, a pre-Reformation movement that rejected many of the distinctive teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. In the early Middle Ages, most Western Christian people encountered the Bible only in the form of oral versions of scriptures, verses and homilies, in Latin. Other sources were mystery plays, usually conducted in the vernacular, and popular iconography. Though relatively few people could read at this time, Wycliffe's idea was to translate the Bible into the vernacular, saying it helpeth Christian men to study the Gospel in that tongue in which they know best Christ's sentence. End quote. Although today, there are many who would like to scandalize John Wycliffe, especially among the Counter-Reformation, he has been recognized in many historical circles, as the actual source and origin, of the Protestant Reformation of Western Europe. Soon after the death of John Wycliffe, another professor who was master, dean and rector, at the Charles University of Prague, named John Huss, echoed the ideas of John Wycliffe. But unlike Wycliffe, Huss did not enjoy protection from Rome, by the crown, 
he was subsequently burned at the stake. After the death of John Huss, the Reformation in Europe, was carried forward by numerous scholars and peasants. Among them included John Calvin in France, Martin Luther and Martin Bucer in Germany, Zwingli in Switzerland, and many many others. Critics and detractors of John Wycliffe, have pointed out that, after translating the scriptures, he became the source in Western civilization, for Biblical Unitarianism, or the rejection of the Roman Trinity, and thus have labeled him a heretic, under the ecclesiastical laws of the Church of England. Others however, have debated the claim he was a Biblical Unitarian. But no doubt in either case, modern secular scholars today, also acknowledge, the Roman Trinity doctrine, developed 300 years after the time of Christ, is clearly absent in the texts, not only of the Old Testament, but the New Testament, as well. Being an anachronistic doctrine formulated by Latin theologians, that was simply transposed onto both text and history, long after, the actual texts, and the events and beliefs surrounding them, had passed into the darkness of ancient history. Although Wycliffe's translations began appearing in circulation between the years of 1382 and 1395, it was the Wycliffe Bible of 1390, which was the final product published by his assistant John Privy. And that is the very date given, on John's astronomically dated timeline. The Wycliffe Bible of 1390 AD, and the coming of the Lollards, was the fulfillment of John's astronomically dated prophecy written over a thousand years before Wycliffe was ever born. And that was the coming of the book, John was told to devour, which also contained, his own writing, of those very words, he devoured. John Wycliffe has been labeled the morning star of the Reformation by those who appreciate what he accomplished in history. But in biblical prophecy, as we find in John's astronomically dated timeline in the book of Revelation, John had prophesied his coming, in the heavens as the rainbow angel or Orion, with his Bible in one hand, and the other raised to heaven. It would not be, until the later reformers such as Bucer, Helwes and Calvin, and the people of the later Reformation, had time to digest the scriptures, that that they begin to see the error and dangers, of Rome's Christ Mass, in December. Although John Wycliffe had repented of many of the things he had been taught by the Roman Catholic Church, John Wycliffe, was still a practicing Catholic, in his own mind. In December of 1384 AD, John Wycliffe, right in the middle of saying the Mass, for the Catholic Feast Day of the Holy Innocents, associated with Christmas, suffered a sudden massive stroke, and fell paralyzed, to the floor in the middle of saying Mass, on December 28th. He remained paralyzed and bedridden for four days, until he died, on New Year's Eve. Thus fulfilling John's prophecy, Corona should be no more. And it is not without accident, that John Wycliffe is often depicted in art, with a very long beard, almost identical to the same beard, seen on what people now often refer to as, Father Time, or, what was actually, Kronos. The scriptures, do not make unrealistic heroes out of people. It speaks the truth about them. Even King David, in all his glory, and his love for God, in the end, was depicted as a failing adulterer. For there is none good but God. But it also gives them credit, where credit is due. And such was the case, for John Wycliffe, who died during the Christmas season of 1384 AD, and whose writings lived on, to fuel the reformation of Europe, religious freedom, and the birth of modern Western democracy. And the work of John Wycliffe and the Lollards, are one of the reasons, we have in our possession, the texts of scripture, and the freedom to read, study and learn, and talk about, what we find in them, today. And this completes the coming of the book, in Revelation chapter 10, and its historical fulfillment, based on John's astronomically dated timeline, of history. In this video, you have seen that Revelation chapter 10 is a prophecy by John that was astronomically dated from 1355 AD to 1390 AD, and was fulfilled in the coming of John Wycliffe and the Lollard movement. And you saw that John's prophecy of a great seven thunderstorm, astronomically dated to 1362 AD, actually occurred to the year, and was known as the Grote Mandring, or the Great Drowning of Men, killing 25,000 people in the same part of Western Europe that the Reformation arose. And you saw that the seven voices, 
referred to the seven leaders of the Lollard movement, who eventually brought the coming of the book, which was the publication of the 13 Annie Wycliffe Bible. And none of this had anything to do with the end of time, but rather had to do with John's warning, to this very same movement, that Cronos should be no more. And you saw how that warning foreshadowed the death of John Wycliffe himself, as he was struck down by God, literally in the middle of saying Mass, during Christmas of 1384, and his subsequent death on New Year's Eve. In the next video, we will examine, the famous texts, of Revelation chapter 11, and you will see, once again, how the Counter-Reformation has gone to incredibly ridiculous lengths, to actually hide, the real contents of the book of Revelation, from the public. And you will also see, once again, why they felt they had no choice but to do so, being named by this book, as the very enemies, of the real Christ, of the New Testament. Thank you, for watching.